everyone and, and welcome. And on behalf of the Law and Global Health Steering Committee, it's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, this event is part of our uh, lecture series with a focus on sexual and reproductive health and rights. And it is our uh, culminating event for the year in terms of bringing a lot of the different pieces together that we have been working on. Uh, can I ask you to please uh, check out our website uh, because on our website, you'll see that we have uh, ensured that everything that's been live streamed is available there in terms of all the events that we've done so far. It's also on the Institute's Facebook page. So for people that have not been able to be present at some of our other fabulous events, hopefully you can catch up in, in that way. Um, today's lecture, however, which is I think the most exciting of all, uh, we have uh, social movements, sexual rights and reproductive rights the global context of Me Too. And Pardis Madavia is our speaker. And um, I can say some fabulous things about her, which I will in a moment. Um, but um, the thing that I, I really want to say is that she's an incredible thinker. And she really has a way of taking ideas that you may have heard about at different moments and kind of randomly and then putting it together in a way that you, you have an aha moment. You know, that moment of like logic, like, oh, right, of course. Of course, I never thought of it that way. Okay, so it's like, so I, I appreciate the aha moments that your writing gives me and the few conversations that, that we have had. So let me say a few things about her structurally. She is the acting dean at the Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. And before coming to uh, Denver, she served at Pomona College as professor and chair of anthropology, the director of the Pacific Basin Institute, as well as the dean of women. She's been a fellow at the Social Science Research Council, the American Council on Learned Society, Google Ideas, and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And her research interests are wide ranging and kind of amazing. And as somebody who myself considers myself to be fairly productive as a scholar, one of the things that kind of blows my mind is that she has five single authored books. Um, and she's working on a few more right now. So she is in many ways, absolutely amazing. And we're very happy to have her here. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much to Sophia for such a generous introduction. You're definitely making me blush, especially somebody whose work I've admired my entire life. It was so exciting when I finally got to meet Sophia. And, and, and for somebody who, you know, my work has been in conversation with yours yeah. for, for, for decades. So it feels very you know, synergistic. Thank yeah. you. So thank you all for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my newest book project. And for me, this is kind of a foray into the world of, of trade, if you will. Um, I want to intervene on a, on a discourse with which I'm uncomfortable. Um, so, you know, a lot of my work looks at the disconnect between discourse and policy on the one hand and lived experience on the other. As an anthropologist by training, I try to complicate our perceptions of what we think of as, you know, make the strange familiar and the familiar strange, right? That's the kind of root, root of anthropology. But a lot of my work has sought to complicate how we understand and receive um, categories or discourses such as human trafficking or sex work, right? Um, and so when a lot of these social movements, um, such as Me Too, such as Enough, um, started to, to really take root at, at within discourses across the United States, I began to feel a little bit uncomfortable with the vacuum in which these conversations were being had, right? And so this project is, I, I, in this project, I seek to make an intervention on that to decenter the US in our conversation about a lot of these social movements and to talk a bit more robustly about what I call a global feminism reboot um, that is undergirding a lot of these social movements. So everybody here is familiar with me too, yes? Okay, raise your hand if you're familiar with Mujeres en la Marcha. Couple, okay. Those of you who don't know that, an abortion rights movement in Chile, and it's, it's continuing on. I will speak a little bit more about that. Roads Must Fall, a few of you, right? That was the social movement. It continues, uh, began in South Africa um, and sort of taking down the, the, the statue of Rhodes, but it was really about um, tuition prices and, and, and a decolonizing of the higher education experience. And then, of course, hashtag enough. 
runs from my road to them, right? So this is the core of my argument for this book project, really. So I'm arguing that there's a resurgence or a what I'm calling a reboot of feminism that's going on around the world that is undergirding transformative movements such as Me Too, Time's Up, Enough, or Roads Must Fall. And I will say that this feminism reboot that I'm observing around the world um, is much more critical, right? It's critical of neoliberalism. It's critical of neoliberal feminism, right? It's critical of a feminism that had not been reflexive or acknowledging of intersectionality or, or, or power and privilege, right? So there's this resurgence going on around the world and this feminism reboot, and the second point is perhaps the most important, has actually started in the global south in places such as Iran, India, Chile, or Uganda, right? These are, these are my, my four main field sites as well as most recently I've been working in South Korea, but this is really important, right? Because when we talk about Me Too and we talk about feminism undergirding social movements, there is a sense that all of this was invented here in the US, right? And my work has actually shown that a lot of this groundwork has been laid by countries in the global south. I mean, all of you are familiar with the Arab Spring, right? Quick show of hands, Arab Spring, yes, okay. How about Iran's Green Movement? Okay, some of you. So Iran's Green Movement, which I'll talk about in a minute, was actually the precursor to the Arab Spring, right? And so that was happening in the early 2000s, the buildup, and then the Green Movement was, of course, 2009. These were all feminist movements that were taking place in the global south. And people haven't been making those connections to the fact that a lot of the groundwork, a lot of the roots for what we see in these transformative social movements today has been happening in the global south. And then finally, and also very importantly, the issues of sexuality and sexual and reproductive rights and health have actually set the stage for this new feminism that is giving birth to social movements worldwide. And what I mean by that is when we think about the Arab Spring, when we think about Iran's Green Movement, that was inspired by Iran's sexual revolution about which I started writing in the early 2000s. So actually movements to gain more sexual and reproductive rights and health led to sexual revolutions, which led to social movements, laying the groundwork for what we see today. And then of course, social media, right? So you're also in an era where this activist organizing can instantaneously be shared with other organizers around the world. And so one of the things that I've powerfully seen in the global South is people sharing strategies and ideas. And that has gradually made its way here to the United States as well. So you hear you've got this sort of eruption of, of feminism that's people tether it to Me Too, but I think it's important to think, step back first about the roots and then, of course, then the branches, kind of the bookends um, on, on either side. So as an anthropologist, we love, we love our field notes, right? So I want to read to you a little bit from my field notes because I think it illustrates a lot of the argument that I'm making. Um, so, so this is from my field notes from December of 2017. <clears throat> Ready or not, we're coming for you, 45, and we're coming in our pussy hats, said Rufina, on the morning of December 30th, 2017, in a community organizing room as she prepared a group of activists for the Women's March the following month. Rufina is an activist who was a central organizer for the first Women's March that was designed to coincide with the inauguration of America's 45th president. After pulling on her pink knitted hat, and again, they're quite um, critical of the pink hat movement. They're sort of doing this in kind of an ironic way. Rufina grabbed her crotch, making gyrating hip movements as she used her other hand to play a makeshift guitar with her pink hat. The crowd went wild with women, men, and non-binary individuals grabbing their pink hats and gyrating in unison. This is so rad, began Chris, whose gender pronoun is they. Chris was floating around the room, one of hundreds of activists cheering Rufina on. I mean, it's not rad that we have to do this because of the mango Mussolini, but it's rad that we're coming together, organizing feminists, womanists, and people like me. It took a tyrant to bring us together, but now we're coming together, standing firm, taking our bodies back and fighting back. End quote. Chris has been active in the movement for LGBT sexual and reproductive rights since 2010, but has felt that there's been a lot of divisions between groups of activists under the previous administration, despite things being admittedly better in many ways. She, they said, quote, and sexuality seemed to be a lightning rod issue, like a battle line. But now it's like we realize that we have to come together across our differences because we're all fighting for our bodies now and we're all trying to show the world how ridiculous this presidency is, they added. 
Across the room, individuals from a variety of socioeconomic and ethnic groups joined in conversation to strategize how to maximize their impact and make their voices heard. After the organizing event, Rufina collapsed into a chair, exhausted. She pulled at her pink hat and tied back her long, thick black curls, wiping off her pink lipstick. I'm just exhausted, you know, she asked rhetorically. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm excited and I feel like there's real movement now. And I guess me too gave us even more fuel, but battlefield fatigue is real. It just sometimes feel like we're moving uphill, you know, like Sisyphus rolling that stupid big rock. But I have to remind myself, look at how far we've come, right? But then I wake up the next day and we're still fighting. Rufina shifted in her seat, removing her black thigh high leather boots. She said, tell me again about the fight in Iran. Show me the Facebook feed. I want to draw some energy. Earlier that same day, Mahtab, an activist in the Civil <coughs> Revolution in Iran, posted her feelings on Facebook with the following post. This morning, I flung my hijab out the window, took my boyfriend's hand in public, and bought a pack of condoms. Just days after the announcement that women in Tehran would no longer be arrested for having their heads covered, Facebook feeds of Iranians around the world filled with pictures of young women without hijab running through the streets of Tehran. I never thought this would happen, said Matov. I mean, we've been working for this, working hard for this since 2000 and putting ourselves on the line every day, but I wasn't sure we were getting anywhere, you know? Matov is one of the many activists in Iran who've been pressing for social change in Iran via what they call the Engelov Agency, which translates to sexual revolution. Since the early 2000s, young people, first in Tehran, then in other parts of the country, have engaged in sexual politics, using their bodies to speak back to a regime with which they disagree. Because the Iranian regime has come to power under a fabric of morality, eschewing what has been referred to as West toxication, or Qarb Zadegi, Young people engaging in the sexual revolution have been resisting the morality through which the regime seeks to operationalize its power. So in essence, this is a regime in Iran that came to power under a fabric of morality, right? They came to power um, with the premise of fighting West toxication. So young people in a way to attack the regime attack that fabric of morality through sexuality. Sexuality is of heightened concern and thus politicized for and by many Islamists. And I hope you're hearing some echoes of what's happening today, right? Here in the US. Young people speak back with their sexualities to resist a regime with which they do not agree. But for us, it's always one step forward, two steps back, said Hoda, a close friend of Mahtab's who was most active during the green movement in Iran in 2009. We make gains, change things, the hijab goes back. Maybe we can go outside with sandals and no socks. Maybe we get a president like Khatami who listens to young people, but then we get Ahmadinejad. In 2009, when Ahmadinejad won the presidency, many Iranians came out in force, protesting that the elections were not fair or transparent. The Green or Sabs movement, led by women and iconic figures such as Neda, the young woman who was murdered by police during a protest, or presidential candidate Mousavi's wife, who was visibly outspoken, took the nation by storm. Many say that the Green Movement was a civil rights movement, that it, that it was inspired by the sexual revolution and in turn inspired the Arab Spring. It was our sexual politics that sparked the Green Movement, recalled Huda. It was young people organizing, coming together to rethink morality, values, our body, and this led to the SADS movement, end quote. While the Green Movement did not receive much media attention and many young people throughout Iran found a voice to speak out against oppression, the political situation in Iran did not change significantly as a result at first. Quote, we still had hijab, we still weren't supposed to wear makeup, be ourselves, you know, be free. And women were still getting virginity checks, still had to go the back door for abortions, still had to hide boyfriends. And of course, Ahmadinejad was still president, reflected Huda. But you could feel that things were changing and it gave us an important outlet not to give up hope. In 2014 and later 2016 and 17, another movement began to take hold in Iran, this one aptly named with the handle hashtag my stealthy freedom. Cleverly deploying social media, and it's quite important here to see the return of social media in all of these movements, young women posted pictures of themselves without hijab, dancing in the street, wearing makeup, holding hands with partners, and in general, defying norms of morality laid out by members of the regime. Quote, we were tired after the green movement. We saw what was happening during the Arab Spring next door, but we were exhausted and it was hard to organize. 
But when my stealthy freedom happened, we got a new energy. And then this energy was really energized when Me Too happened because it gave us the push we needed both inside and outside of Iran. And I can speak more about the kind of the, the social movements that happened since the green movement. What you see today in Iran is probably some of you followed 2017, 2018. You had mass protests of people, rural areas, urban areas coming out, speaking against the regime. And a lot has shifted in Iran since then. Many attribute it, of course, to, to the green movement. Neighboring Egypt has followed a similar trajectory since the early 2000s. While young people in Iran were engaging in their sexual revolution, young women in Egypt were organizing and blogging about sexuality and sexual rights. In 2001, a high profile case in Cairo involved the arrest of 53 men at a nightclub under 1950s laws on debauchery and prostitution. These men were members of the LGBTQ community and their arrest was meant to send a signal from the government that such behavior would not be tolerated. This, of course, was like a declaration of war, said Karim, an Egyptian LGBT rights activist who went to court to advocate on behalf of the men who had been arrested. The government wants to make sex political and send a political message through sex. Then they have to be ready for a fight, he said. Numerous activists joined the fight to speak out against sexual oppression and the political situation, using sexuality and identity politics to stake their claims. The Queen Vote case was just the beginning because, of course, it went beyond LGBT rights to be about sexual politics more broadly speaking, says Amr Shalakani, um, a, a, an academic who works on the intersections of sexuality and law in the Arab world. As the government tried to crack down using old laws and enact their power through sex, more and more people started speak, speaking back, Shalakani added. One of the people whom you may have heard of was Alia Magda El Mahdi, who called herself the new blogger of Egypt. El Mahdi began posting pictures of herself naked online in October of 2011. One of her pictures was accompanied by a Facebook post describing her reasoning behind such postings as, quote, screams against a society of violence, racism, sexism, sexual harassment, and hypocrisy, end quote. El Mahdi's activism set off a wave of blog posts from young women speaking out about these issues, while El Mahdi herself had to leave her home country as a result of increasing death threats. By 2015 and 2016, some of the activism in Egypt had died down as activists encountered feelings of battlefield fatigue. In April of 2017, several more men were arrested for using Grindr and other debaucherous sexual apps. Like in Iran, however, when Me Too became a global phenomenon, women and men in Egypt were inspired again. The hashtag Ana Aiden spread like wildfire across Egypt and the rest of the Maghreb. Activists began to call for increased awareness of sexual violence, and they drew attention to the distinct forms of assault that Egyptians endured as a result of their sexualities. This globally informed activist context for the Me Too movement adds a new and distinctly transnational dimension to contemporary discussions of sexual politics. So the idea is that there was a lot happening before Me Too, right? That there was a lot of groundwork being built, a lot of social movements being launched, and then Me Too, kind of was a, a, a catalyzing moment for some, but the way that it's depicted in popular media is Me Too happened in the US in a vacuum, which of course, as I'm arguing, it did not. Um, and then it spread to the rest of the world who then started organizing. And again, this is what I'm trying to decenter, right? This is what I'm trying to uh, intervene on. So the argument really comes from this, this notion that sexual revolutions Right, that are that are taking place um, and inspiring social movements across the globe are leading to social transformation. So some of the theoretical framework that contours the study, and if I have more time, I would get into it. But Asif Bayat's work, Michael Cook's work, Hebdige, of course, subculture and the meaning of style, how people can support their resistance, how the body becomes really a central nodal point um, for much of this uh, resistance. Um, and you know, how people can negotiate um, their rights through intimacy and what Giddens uh, and Jennifer Hirsch call intimate citizenship, right? So sexual revolutions have been on the rise around the world. Um, they take place often when regimes come to power through promises to restore a moral order, as in the case of the Islamists in Iran, Modi in India, or some might say our current US president. When individuals in these countries cannot negotiate their citizenship vis-a-vis -vis the state, they turn to the realm of the intimate, attempting to assert themselves in and through sexual and reproductive rights. Simultaneously, people find that they can resist a regime with which they do not agree by unraveling the fabric of morality on which the state relies. In the case of both US and Iran, much of that morality was tethered, albeit in different ways, to sexuality. People are speaking back to Trump by asserting their sexualities, 
taking back agency that was robbed from them when he became president. And in Iran, young people engage in sexual behaviors that are illegal under Islamist interpretation of, of Sharia law. Now, there are many examples throughout history of sexual revolutions in Europe, uh, in the Czech Republic, Weimar, Germany, or even in the United States during the 1960s. Um, of course, everyone's probably familiar with the kind of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But the sexual revolutions in, in, in the US, in Canada, in Europe, were about more than changing views towards sexuality and intimacy. At their core was a search for authenticity and autonomy while resisting authority. But again, sexuality is the kind of undergirding framework. During sexual revolution in Canada in the 1960s, for instance, which people don't read about, the, Can the Canadian one as often, youth experimented with sexual relations outside of traditional heteronormative familial arrangements, which set the stage for broader so societal exploration. Simultaneously, a series of interconnected movements emerged, including the struggle for civil rights, women's rights, minority rights, the rights of the disabled, and LGBTQ rights. These movements were often connected to broader justice advocacy, such as anti-poverty, lower income housing, and unionization. <clears throat> so I'm gonna um, kind of skip to some of my uh, case studies because I think that those illustrate. So Iran was of course one of, one of my main um, case studies, but I also have done fieldwork more recently uh, in, in Chile, uh, as well as in India and Uganda and South Korea. <laughs> so across the Atlantic from the Middle East, women's movements in Guatemala and Chile have also achieved major milestones in the last two years. In February of 2016, a Guatemalan court prose prosecuted two former members of the military for harrowing acts of sexual violence committed during the military conflict that lasted from 1960 to 1996. In a historic ruling for rape survivors in Guatemala, two male suspects were found guilty of crimes against humanity for sexually abusing 15 indigenous women and sentenced to a combined 360 years in prison. In August of 2017, a Chilean women's movement known as Mujeres en Marcha drove the passage of a new law that legalizes abortion. 2017, right? And people weren't talking about this. They kept talking about Me Too and they were trying to make the argument that Me Too brought about this, which of course is erroneous because this happened in August of 2017 and Me Too wasn't even until October. But this success was a major victory for women's reproductive rights uh, in Latin America and signaled that the door may now be open for further reform. <clears throat> in India, on September 6th of, of 2018, the Supreme Court in India voted unanimously to repeal section 377, a colonial era law that criminalized homosexuality. The decision was met with absolute jubilation in India and served as an inspiration to many activists around the world suffering from battlefield fatigue in the push for sexual and gender rights. But again, it's important to track that a lot has been happening, right? These are various um, activist movements that have been taking place in India prior to 2018, right? So when the 377 was repealed, the headlines, if you look here in the United States, the headline said, you know, Me Too movement inspires repeal of 377, right? And it's like, yeah, except look, I mean, dating back to 2003, there have been all of these movements that have actually been laying the groundwork. So if anything, Me Too in the US benefits from the global groundwork that was laid. In the words of one of my interlocutors, Niti, she said, quote, in the midst of all that darkness, and she's referring to Modi's regime here, all of the living in what seemed like the dark ages of dealing with near constant patriarchy and repression, Suddenly, this rainbow burst through. I love that, the term, right, the rainbow. Um, it seemed like we would never get change. We've been pushing, organizing, pushing, and watching what's happening in the US and around the world. And then suddenly, success, end quote. The momentum that produced this change has been building in India during the past two decades. In 2003, you had the Blank Noise Project, a movement against everyday forms of sexual harassment in India. In 2009, the Pink Chali Project came to the fore, protesting official rules policing morality as well as women's whereabouts in public. In 2011, Slut Walk, protesting victim blaming and Why Loiter, a project decrying bans on women's presence in public spaces also gained momentum. All of this came to a head in 2012 when the violent gang rape of Jyoti Singh on a bus resulted in her death. The outrage over this incident brought women together to strategize for larger change. As with Me Too's global success in 2017, women and allies started organizing to bring down politicians who had been involved in sexual harassment. 
the success of their efforts built a foundation for the repeal of 377. So if I had more time in, in the India chapter of my book, I actually show how women organized, used the uh, momentum against sexual harassment and sexual violence to sway judges on the Supreme Court to vote to repeal 377, which I think is just a brilliant deployment of, of sexual politics. In South Korea, women's movements have been gaining strength for the past five years, at least. After Me Too, these movements have, have been infused with a, with a new energy. But the point is that they were organizing way before. The 2016 murder of a Korean woman exiting the bathroom at the Gangnam Metro Station was especially significant for women's organizing in South Korea. Following this event, women took to the streets in protest of sexual violence and assault. While these protests invited significant backlash, resulting in numerous women losing their jobs and being ostracized from their communities, they also evidenced the success of the feminism reboot across Asia in inspiring many women to speak out and providing fuel for protests that continue today. Notably, in January of last year, Sao Ji-hyun, a well-known protester, went public with the accusation that a former Ministry of Justice official groped her at a funeral in 2010. This public accusation was a watershed moment between January and April of 2018, hundreds of other women came forward with their stories against noted politicians. In March of 2018, presidential candidate and Governor An Hee Jung resigned after he was accused of raping his secretary. Later that month, on March 23rd, thousands came out for a marathon protest during which 193 women spoke for 2,018 minutes straight about their experiences with sexual assault. The event was significant in its magnitude as well as its location. It took place in the same area as where in 2017, thousands had gathered for a mass candlelight demonstration against the now ousted president. South Koreans know the power of protest. And in April of 2018, the Korean president addressed the Me Too movement in South Korea by publicly calling for a societal shift specifically within corporate culture. So is there a new feminism? I'm arguing that yes, that it is a different type of feminism. So people are asking why now? Right? Why is it happening now in the United States? And, and my answer to that is it's been happening since the 2000s. If not, I mean, there's obviously over a century of organizing, but this new type of feminism that is rooted in a critique of neoliberalism um, that, that deploys the tools of social media. And if, if I had time, I would kind of get deeper into each of my case studies. The Chile case study is really interesting because they used social media to pressure the government uh, into allowing them to change their curriculum. They closed down colleges and universities across Santiago. Very interesting case. Um, and you know, what I'm seeing is that success inspires success and maybe that's overly hopeful, but what I'm seeing is that activists in Iran and Uganda are exchanging ideas. Activists in Chile and India are exchanging ideas, right? That that is part of the power of social media. But we have to recognize that this is not a US only moment, right? That there's been all of this groundwork and sure there have been branches, um, but, but that this groundwork has been laid uh, predominantly in the global South. Now, has there been slippage? Yes, right? Has there been backsliding? Yes, of course there has, right? There have, you know, the, the case of Iran I find so interesting because you had the green movement and then you had Ahmadinejad and it took almost a decade later for some of these changes to be, to be felt. So could you argue that in the United States, there's slippage. Yeah, you could, right? If you look at the Kavanaugh hearing, you could. But on the other hand, you have more women and women of color in particular elected to Congress than ever before. So is there slippage? Yes, of course there's slippage. One step back, one step forward, two steps back, one step forward, right? But the point is, is that if we stop kind of resisting and stop turning inward and saying, this is kind of us and we're spreading it outward and we start to recognize roots and branches and we start to organize across borders, which we can do now, there's gonna be a much more of a longer lasting um, power for, for this movement. So I think I'll stop there. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm really struck by the diversity of essays in your study. Yeah. I wonder if you could say something about the complexity of kind of gather like narratives around the world across such different political contexts, yeah. religious contexts. Yeah. Like this huge uh, diversity in terms of space for civil society and yeah. movements and and voice, voices coming from civil society. Yeah. That just seems like a huge challenge trying to make it all work. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, let me say this. 
So I wrote a book in 2000, it came out in 2007 or eight, and it was on sexual revolution in Iran. And at the end of that book, I said, this sexual revolution is gonna to lead to a civil rights type movement and that's gonna spread across the region. I think that's from the last chapter of my book. It happened a year later, right? But nobody was persuaded by the one case study, right? And you know, I was like banging my head against a wall um, because you know you had okay, yeah, okay, so that's Iran, and Iran has its, and that was the response. Well, it has its own context, and maybe people, yeah, but there are similarities, right? There are similarities between the Green Movement and the Arab Spring, which everybody started writing about after, right? And so too, you can see similarities. I will say that my struggle was just physically getting to all these places often enough, which you know I have spent the last two years doing. Um, flying to these different places and spending as much time there as I can. But I've been greatly facilitated through social media, obviously. So I get to do a lot of interviews over Skype. I get to do a lot of interviews, you know, through WhatsApp, right? Telegram. I mean, all of this is really facilitated the methodology. But you're right. I mean, these are really different contexts. What I think is amazing about all of all of this, if you take it together, these cases, these four case studies, is that with such different contexts, these women, and it is primarily women and, and non-binary folks, have been able to achieve successes using similar strategies and pushing the envelope, even though they're in really different contexts with really different amount of space to, to, to do that work. Um, you, you see a similar level of success across each of these case studies. Now it looks different, right? In Chile, it looks like a complete overhaul of the university system, right? Of what's taught in the curriculum, of you know who gets, how the presidency is, you know, there's that. In Iran, from the outside, it doesn't seem as obvious, but the fact that women can go without hijab now is huge, right? The fact that you've got this reformist president is enormous, right? The fact that that they're completely changing kind of the, the scope of their currency and, 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 and employment, you know, this is big, right? And so, yeah, the scope is different and from the outside, it looks different, but when you trace it back, it comes from a really similar kind of feminist activism, which I, I find really interesting. Yes. Do you think this is true of other forms of human rights changes? Is this uh, issue of often America is both credited and, and negated for initiating something, which, as you point out so well in this uh, process, it is not America alone. But do you see this in racial issues and other kinds of issues as well, the same pattern? <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't know because I haven't, that's, that's not kind of been the focus of my, I think probably my colleagues uh, down the road at Occidental might be in a better position to answer that question. Um, but, but I've really, since the 90s, been focused on sexuality and sexual movements, right, sexual politics. And so while I've looked a little bit at how sexual movements dovetail with civil rights movements, so I, I talked about, you know, that kind of dovetailing you even saw here in the 1960s, you certainly see it in Weimar Germany and in the Czech Republic. Um, I'm not a scholar of, of race studies, so I wouldn't feel comfortable speaking to that, but I'd be curious if someone were to do that comparative work. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, one of the things you mentioned briefly was the human trafficking issue. Mm -hmm. uh, all, the, all the programs you're talking about, it seems that the human trafficking issue has been uh, coming forward now. We see that pretty much talk about it in India, and in the Middle East, here in Los Angeles, here in Disneyland, <coughs> here at football games. Mm -hmm. So what, do, what are you seeing internationally on the human trafficking issue uh, of women and men? What, so, I mean, I guess that was kind of the focus of my, my, my previous work. I mean, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the kind of moral panic that's generated through the discourse of human trafficking. I think what you have is, you know, in places like Dubai or Iran, right, you had people looking at migration, gendered migration, and, and then when trafficking became this big kind of moral panic hot button issue, um, everyone just wanted to dump everything into that and it conflated with sex work and it conflated with everything, right? And, and you couldn't untangle the streams and, and it was sort of everything in, into, the, into the, you know, kitchen sink kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, I, I used to like joke about, I felt like I was trafficked into talking about trafficking. Like, um, because it's such a, it's such a complex um, 
framework that that did really come from the U.S. and the kind of a sense of securitization. And in many cases, in many instances, it was the hyper feminized antidote to the hyper masculinized war on terror. Right. So the war on trafficking and the war on terror, same year, 2001. Right. And the war on trafficking was the hyper feminized antidote, both with a similar goal. Right. Which was to um, castigate, you know, Muslim men and like the other male as as villains and, and cast women as victims. And that kind of binary casting has never sat well with me. So I, I actually turned back to this project because I just couldn't got to a point where I couldn't write about trafficking anymore. It was just getting too miserable. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I was I was excited by what I saw happening in India and Iran, and that's where I'd been concentrating a lot of my work. And then I was just very uncomfortable when I, when I saw what was happening around me too, and this assertion that, oh, this new feminism is being born in the United States and spreading. You know, I just was like, no, no, that's a conversation I feel like I need to interview. One of the things I wanted to say you said that probably started here because you, you, we even have this issue on our college campuses of trafficking. Mm -hmm. And one of the administrators in one of the country that are starting to uh, uh, realize that they're talking about it now. I work with people that, as a researcher on trafficking people who make videos. Mm -hmm. And they've gone to places where people are like Uganda, they've been there, they've been in Pakistan, they've been in India, they've been in uh, Chile, uh, where this is going on. So I know the complexity of it. But here is it's really starting to take off. And maybe I was hoping that you might want to revisit it or something. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think when we talk about trafficking, what we have to ask ourselves are what are the conditions that have been created that are making people have to move under such difficult circumstances, right? What does the global political economy look like that has created a circumstance in which people are literally willing to risk their lives to move? I mean, people, they're not stupid. They know that this is a risk, right? But, you know, I think about my interlocutors who took such a chance in going to Dubai. What are the circumstances in Uganda that make somebody feel like they have to go to Dubai, even though something really bad could happen to them because they can't stay at home and make ends meet? So this organizing for me is more interesting because it, it creates, it also, what I like about this work is, and this organizing is it allows activists to separate their identities from just their jobs, right? It allows them to come to a sense of identity as activists themselves. And it, and it is empowering in this way. And it, and it allows activists to feel like they are making a change in their home countries without having to, having to leave. So they're trying to make a better situation to stay home. Yes. Yes, the historical, exactly. Yeah, so I look at those kind of groups, but then what's interesting about Chile is you have this kind of quiet period under Pinochet, right? And so my question has been, well, what created the resurgence, right? So you have the penguin, right? The March of the Penguins, which was so interesting in 2017. What, why? You know, why is it after that quiet period, you know, the Pinochet years, um, what what inspired it? And what I've heard from activists who were active in the 70s and the 80s is it's this new generation. And this new generation is emboldened because of this sort of more critical feminism. Um, so that's been really I do draw some parallels, but I also draw some important distinctions, right? Because this generation, I mean, the March of the Penguins, right? Which is the hashtag right now, March of the Rose Penguins, is so interesting to me because they were able to put that together. Can with, you explain in, a little bit? Yeah, so the March of the Penguins was, um, it was basically thousands of university students across the country, across Chile, came out in black and white uh, uniforms, which is why they started calling them the March of the Penguins calling it the March of the Penguins. And they were they were marching um, against tuition fees. Again, you know, this was part of that whole kind of university change. But what was so interesting about the March of the Penguins is that it was organized within a, a span of three days. They were able to track kind of the first inception of the idea to when the march happened and it was three days. And they got hundreds of thousands of people who they were calling Penguins. Um, 
out in the streets. And that's something that could never have happened in the South, right? And, and so then the president had to sit down and the president caved, right? They were, they were protesting um, a rule that said high school students had to pay exam fees for college entrance exams. And they were protesting another rule, another law, that was about transportation, price of transportation, because it used to be at some point that students could get free transportation to and from um, school at the high school and college level. And then there was a new law that was proposed that was gonna not allow them to do that. The Penguins came out and said, absolutely not. And they got the president to sit down and repeal the law. All of this happened within like, it was lightning fast. So really interesting. You really emphasize the benefits of social media and how it's created a sense of cooperativity both nationally and internationally. But have you ever seen instances where social media has undermined progression? Mm -hmm. oh, right. The trolling, the death threats, right, all of that. I mean, with 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 Iran, um, the green movement would not have happened though without social. I mean, oh, March of the Penguins wouldn't have happened, right? So what I I, I think that I don't want to paint an overly rosy picture of social media, because you're right, there is, people are constantly, you know, if you look at even the Women's March here in the United States, right, you look at Linda Sarsour, for instance, right now, and Carmen Perez, and you look at how social media has brought them down, right, so social media can build icons, and social media can bring them down. What I like about two of the case studies, Chile and Iran, is they figured out how to use social media in a positive way without, um, it being tethered to like one person who wanted to, they created like the penguins account or they created like other accounts so that when people were being attacked that people weren't being singled out and and so i think the important thing about some of this organizing is how people um try to get ahead of the pitfalls of, so, of social media um, and that's something that we don't talk about in the us right the fact that in chile and iran people kind of thought two and three steps ahead um it's really interesting to me uh, like there was another movement, it was called We Are All Magic, and this was in Iran, where um, it, was, it was a movement for, for, for trans rights, and everyone came out, uh, men came out, or posting pictures of themselves in hijab uh, on, on Facebook, but it was like, you know, it was organized, so it was, you know, thousands of men doing it, and it was all in this one account, so you couldn't target one person in particular, if that makes sense. So there was a lot of kind of trying to get ahead of it. Um, but you're right. I mean, I think I wouldn't want to paint an overly picture, overly rosy picture. I just, I think we need to think a little bit more deeply about the role of social media in facilitating, like, how can it be used in a positive way, right? How can it be used to facilitate dialogue and, and strategies? You know, one of the things about the um, Arab Spring was that people all had cell phones and they were capturing every bit of the abuse and posting it right on on social media and that was hugely important for them right but of course some of the people who posted then got taken it you know so how do you get ahead of that right and i think we need to we need to talk through the consequences yes um really appreciative that you highlighted uh how worldwide this government's movement is and uh, how many countries you've included in your study um, not so much appreciating that you're trying to tie it to a particular type of politics, because I imagine that many of the women in various countries, and even women um, within any given country, have quite a variety of politics, and uh, that, that there are reasons for um, wishing um, for uh, an unharassed life for themselves. Uh, can vary greatly. So um, I'm sure that there are women in Korea who simply do not want to be harassed at work and don't want to overthrow their capitalist system or something. I'm sure there are women in India who would like to walk down the street uh, without being ass grabbed and who do not necessarily want to overthrow their system. Um, also, um, for the movement of people, that you mentioned uh, to question uh, why somebody might uh, take the risk, and they do take huge risks of leaving their countries to go into an unknown. Uh, where people go is, you will know this because you're widely traveled, but most people don't know that where people go is not as obvious as, as all that. So even though uh, Ugandans may be fleeing, there are people fleeing into Uganda. 
So there are people from South Sudan and from uh, East, East Congo who are nevertheless entering Uganda. Um, even though people would wish to flee Sudan for many good reasons, there were people from Eritrea who would wish to enter Sudan and did and remained there in camps. So it's very difficult for us to attribute why somebody should flee and in what direction they will flee and what they find in the new place and to tie that all together with uh, you know, the women's movement. Oh, I wasn't tying it together with the women's movement. He just asked a question about it because um, I had written I, work on that. And I, I certainly wasn't, I certainly wasn't, question. yeah. And I certainly wasn't um, trying to, if, if you let me answer, it would be helpful. Um, I certainly wasn't trying to uh, assert that people aren't coming into Uganda. I just was simply using a case study of something that I've worked on, which is Ugandans in Dubai, with whom I've interviewed many um, through my previous field work. Um, and to, you know, I think to speak to your, your earlier point, um, this, is a, this is something I often would tell people about Iran. People would say, well, isn't just, isn't, isn't, aren't some of these women just wearing red lipstick to, to class because they think it looks good? Yeah, that's true. But the fact of the matter is that if they wear red lipstick and they try to walk into the university, they could get their lips slashed with razors. That was part of the morality police, right? That was in the penal code, right? And so re wearing red lipstick, because it is punishable, becomes an act of political resistance, just like rocking an afro would have become would have been seen as an act of political uh, resistance in this country. I think some people might have done it to look good, but it's red as an act of political resistance. Now, it is, of course, the case that these are countries with millions and hundreds of millions of people. So I'm not trying to assert that everybody feels a certain way. Rather, I'm trying to look at pockets of organizing and take people at their word for why they are organizing and what a sexual revolution means to them and, and what the kind of bigger picture is for, for, for some of it. Not at all trying to imply that everybody in Korea feels one way or everybody in Iran feels another way. Rather, I'm looking at some of the, the um, similarities between these different these different. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the case of India a little bit more in terms of how the social movements have influenced law or the enforcement of law yeah. uh, in recent years. You mean like around 377? I don't know what okay, so th so the repeal of 377 was basically uh, the repeal of a colonial era law that criminalized homosexuality, right? Um, so so what you saw was, and it was voted unanimously by the Supreme Court of India to 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 repeal that law. So what what people what women did, and and it was funny because there were there were a group of women actually here in Berkeley um, who created a list, uh, like kind of a, a, a bad a bad men list. Right, and they worked with activists in India, so kind of transnationally this list, and then activists went to people who would be voting on that law and said, "Do you want your name to end up on this list, or do you want to kind of hear us out?" Right, so that was kind of an interesting. Way. Um, in terms of your question about the enforcement of law, I mean that's that's where everything is kind of hung up, right? Because you've got the law on the books, and then you've got the law as it is operationalized. And there's a huge difference there. And, and that's where the Iran case study, I think, is interesting because so with, with a lot of the changes that happened around the Green Movement, or actually during Khatani, you had a lot of changes in the laws on the books. For instance, harm reduction was legalized, right? Needle exchanges were legalized, right? I mean, there were some law, right? But yet people were still pulling over, <laughs> drug users still pulling over, right? And it took about 10 years to start to work those mechanisms through. And a lot of it was kind of a generational shift. And so one of the things I've heard when I listen to activists between Iran and India dialogue is, well, how long is it going to take for the operationalization? I think that's kind of where it's hung up right now. But the fact that you've got actual laws and that court cases could go forward, I mean, not everyone can go, go to court up and everyone can afford that. But the fact that you have this, these symbolic movements, um, I think opens up some space. And with respect to Right, so that, and again, that's something that since the 2012, right, and since the, the Pinchelli project, I mean, yes, you can now go and, and, and take these, these things to court, whereas before you couldn't even go to court. So is rape still happening? Of course, yes, yeah, it's blocking here, too, right? Um, but having a mechanism, I think, was a symbolic change. The other thing that, that you know, you hear about with 377 is the, the, um, the opening for a discourse shift, right? 
So now people talk about rape a lot more openly. Now people can talk about homosexuality outside of just talking about hedras, right? I mean, that's the point is like how you open up space for, for conversation, whether it's in the courts or whether it's in communities. Time for maybe just one. I was going to say, we have time for like one more. One. I have one, but, but who else? Yes, please. Go ahead. Sorry, I think you were first. Uh, um, could you explain a little bit about like the connection between neoliberalism and feminism? Definitely. So um, I think that that feminism for a while, it, it, one of the things I know a lot of my interlocutors would say when I talk to them about what is this like feminism or not, you can tell some of my interlocutors, particularly, you know, in, 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 in Iran and Uganda uh, and in Chile, they felt that feminism was um, something that they didn't identify with because it was a very kind of, it was couched in a very white colonial kind of, you have, because you have this history, and this is where I go through my cases, you have this history of feminists coming to save, right? I mean, India is rife with that history, you know, these feminists are coming to save these women, right? And so people could not associate with that feminism. It was also a feminism that did not acknowledge intersectionality, right? Race, class, genders, that you have these intersections of identity and power. And at some point, the discourse shifted and people said, well, we can have an organic form of feminism. And that's where I felt like the sexual revolution in Iran was so interesting because people, so, you know, when, I, when the book first came out, one of the critiques people would say is, oh, so they're just trying to do like a sexual revolution like we did here. and and. My point and my interlocutor's point was no, we're doing an organic movement, we're calling it a sexual revolution, but it's about changing, you know, using sexuality to change politics. And, and so, you know, the link with neoliberalism is, you know, this new feminism is critical of neoliberalism, right? It's critical of colonialism, it's critical of that. And so there's been the resurgence of space to be able to identify as a feminist without identifying with the kind of a white savior sort of trope. That makes sense. Okay. So with that, I mean, I think there's a lot more to ask and a lot more to say, but thank you so thank much. Thank you.